because what they do is they actually rewire the brain chemistry to yeah. believe to where your brain can only operate normally while on the drug. Yeah. And when you have withdrawn from the drug and the drug is no longer in your system, you you are told your your brain signals to the rest of your body that if you cannot get the drug quickly, you would rather be dead. We are the good doctors of Abbey Research. I am Dr. Aaron. Dr. Kristen. You are very welcome to our continuing conversation about the Hulu docudrama series Dope Sick. We are up to episode four called Pseudo Addiction. And like all these other uh, episode titles, um, we learn all about in this episode uh, the invention of the concept pseudo addiction by Purdue Pharma. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're we're telling the story of of a really horrible part, ongoing part of American history that impacted a lot of people's lives. There's not a lot of happy sunshine and rainbows in this episode either. Uh, we start by spending a little bit more time with our friends at Purdue Pharma talking about why and you know I'll I'll ex- I'll explain this and then I'm sure Dr. Kristen will want to will want to swing back around to this one. They they talk about why they thought Pur- Purdue why they they thought that oxy wouldn't become addictive. Like a- like addicts wouldn't be able to abuse it. Um, and they explained that it was the coating on the pill that kept people from accessing the 12 hour supply that like, so they, you know, they couldn't get to the meat of the drug because of the coating. Um, which I mean, like, is the dumbest thing I've ever heard is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because you can, there's no possible way to get coating off of a pill. That is already, like, built to dissolve within your body and on your saliva and digestive juices. Dumbest ass thing I've ever heard. Dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, yeah, I'm tr- I'm just, I'm skimming my notes here. So I is don't this the, we- is this the episode where we learn about the definition of dope sick? I believe so. Yes. Okay. So uh, we'll definitely punt to you for that. Okay. Um, I don't think we get a lot from Purdue in this one is what I was looking for. Cause I'm kind of okay. going to take things in chunks of the recap. Fair. I apologize. No, no, no. That's okay. I don't think we get a lot from Purdue. The guts of this one is, uh, addressing what's become of Betsy and, uh, Dr. Phoenix. We ended the last episode with Dr. Phoenix getting in a car accident. This this episode shows us a year later, um, and he is addicted. Dr. Phoenix now is addicted to Oxy. He's stealing Oxy from his patients. Um, I'm sorry. I just checked my notes. This is where we do get pseudo addiction, which was okay. uh, Purdue Pharma. Um, so they bring in a dentist. Oh, yeah. Who thinks that all addiction in relation to medication is fake. And his solution is they just need more medication. They just need more opioids. So he is the one that has invented this concept, pseudo-addiction. And Purdue latches onto it like the um, destructive barnacles that they are uh, as a way to justify the continued overprescription of of oxycontin um, and the continued ignorance 
uh, to its ramifications for addicted people all, all over the country. So that's the, the bit we get from Purdue is this explanation of um, pseudo addiction and kind of how they keep um, expanding their scope of horribleness um, to justify their continued money-making venture. So that's what we get from Purdue. From Dr. Phoenix, we get a lot more in-depth of what it looks like to be a doctor addicted to Oxy. Um, and he, you know, he gets, he gets really upset with Billy. Billy comes to see him. Um, and this is where we get the explanation as well from the, um, the, Grand jury, couldn't find the word, uh, about what dope sick is. So we'll get to that, um, and then I'll tee it up for Dr. Kristen, who can talk more about it. But uh, a big part of, of this episode is focused on the FBI investigation where they're trying to prove the criminal misbranding. So th their goal in this is to find a way to prove that Oxy is more than 1%. More than one percent of people who use Oxy become addicted, because that's the oft that's the slogan. Less than one percent of users become addicted. Um, so they start to try and find the source for this statistic, because that's a statistic. It says it's based off of the uh, Porter Jick study, is how it is cited by Purdue Pharma. It is cited in a lot of medical science journals, magazines, Time Life, all those jams. So they keep going down that rabbit hole and they find that um, they get their hands on a copy of the alleged Porter Jick study in a referenced in the 1980 edition of the New England Journal of Medicine. If you are saying, hey, Aaron, that's before Oxycontin was invented, you would be correct, friends at home. Um, they can't, they can't even find the study. What they end up finding is a letter in this journal edition that was written by Dr. Jick and his assistant was this porter person. And it was, uh, it was about opioids in a very limited, very controlled study uh, in a in hospital, hospital setting. In a hospital setting with people who were being prescribed very specific drugs for very specific ailments and were monitored very closely. And this this doctor was, you know, involved in that in that experiment um, and wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a letter that was five sentences long. Five and it gets cited in a 1986 article in Pain Magazine, which was, the article was co-written by Dr. Portnoy, who we know from earlier episodes becomes the, the main proponent, the main advocate for OxyContin and opioids as a use for moderate pain. And so that's, that's where this, you know, Hit, like volcano of destruction comes from this tiny, tiny letter. Um, and at this point, I remember Dr. Kristen and I were watching this episode together and I looked at her and I was like, everything is a lie. Like, <laughs> literally everything is a lie. Every advertisement, like, like if you follow this, you know, an entire pain industry was built on the backs of a five sentence letter to the editor in a journal edition. Um, and they actually get a hold of Dr. Jick, the FBI investigators, and he is horrified to learn that his letter is now the most cited study in the justification for the prescription of opioids for moderate and chronic pain. So that's a huge, huge part of the episode. Uh, as well as um, the description of, of what it means uh, when you are dope sick, which is when I'll, I'll hand it off to Dr. Kristen. Um, we get 
uh, an intervention with our bets as well. Um, her her parents bring in someone from AA. Her girlfriend, ex girlfriend, shows back up from Eureka Springs where she had been living as hopefully an an out and accepted lesbian lady in a mountain town. Um, I hope somebody gets a happy ending in the show, even if it's not like one of the main characters. Um, but they all come back. Uh, to convince, um, to, to stage an intervention with Bets about her addiction, she goes to an AA meeting where she is confronted by a lady in the bathroom who sells her some Oxy. So, um, an oft-repeated pattern, I, I can only imagine. Um, and by the end of the episode, we get Dr. Phoenix going to the dealer who has now been helping Betsy find Oxy. Um, and the, the dealer is the one who tells him to, uh, like crush it up and snort it like cocaine, um, which will get into his system faster. Again, what about that magic coating that was supposed to prevent this from happening? Oh, wait, it's still a pill you can crush. Um, so a lot of things happen in this episode, but I think perhaps for us where we should start uh, and you know way more about this than I do, and I will tee it up for you, is um, the explanation of the phenomenon of dope sick, the physiological reaction to um, this particular opioid, but I'm sure dope sick extends to a lot of things. Yeah, dope sick is, is all opioids. It connects to all opioids. It's one of the really insidious things about opioids, which reminder... Um, the opioid, the hard drug that is in the opioid class is heroin. And so, uh, it is, whew, it is just a bitch of a drug. Opioids are just bitches of drugs because what they do is they actually rewire the brain chemistry to yeah. believe to where your brain can only operate normally while on the drug. Yeah. And when you have withdrawn from the drug and the drug is no longer in your system, you you are told your your brain signals to the rest of your body that if you cannot get the drug quickly, you would rather be dead. Yeah. And you can imagine that desperation that those false brain signals send. This is when people will do anything to get mm. that drug. Anything. I've heard stories of selling spouses into like sexual or like sexual encounters essentially pimping out their spouses to get to get money for the drugs. We know that that ev that many many people enter prostitution themselves in order to get this drug. Um the phenomenon of dope sick is one of the reasons I wish we could kill the moral judgment with fire because it isn't getting clean from opioids is not a simple N getting clean from anything is not simple, but mm. particularly opioids and how insidious they are with, again, the brain chemistry. So there's, there's dope sick is, I think very well um, demonstrated in this particular episode. Dr. Finnick shows us what it is physically while we're getting the voiceover. Um, you see his desperation again. I, if Michael Keaton could just get all the awards, that would be really great. Just hand them um, to him folks. He's doing he's breaking my heart in half and giving me PTSD like all at the same time mm. and doing, doing it really, really well. Dope sick is so, so serious that there are lots of people and we'll find this out in the next episode um, who actually just get the drugs in like a organized, like I know, I know people who have like alerts on their phones and calendar set up. So they know exactly how much they have to be taking and when to just avoid being dope sick. And if you ask a lot of opioid addicts in studies and in conversation, even if they want to quit, they desperately want to quit. They fear dope sick more than anything else. Yeah. And so the question is, can they get over being dope sick? If they can get over being dope sick, then there's more, there's more hope. But the fear of that dope sick feeling is so powerful because it is the most, when I talk to people who have come off of opioids, like I've talked to women who have given birth and they say they'll give birth 400 times before they'll ever be dope sick again. And it was, it feels like your skin is actually beginning to like melt off your body. Some people talk about feeling bugs underneath their skin. You can begin to hallucinate. Um, you can lose control of your bowels. You can, um, you know, there, there's 
people who their eyes get so itchy, they actually start to scratch at their eyeballs. It gets very, very ugly because your brain is desperate to get you on that drug again. Mm -hmm. And it will send whatever signal it has to, to get you on that drug again. So remember, our brains are designed to keep us safe. Our brains are designed to keep us away from danger. So if this chemical has rewritten our brains to believe that we are in danger without this drug, every single human instinct is rewritten. Mm. You will sell, it's, it's one of the things that families of addicts have difficulty understanding. Why can't you choose us over the drug? And the answer is dope sick. That's the answer, especially with opioids. There's other answers for other classes of drugs. But, yeah. for dope, but for opioids, the answer is dope sick. It is unbelievably powerful. And then, of course, you can imagine if you start off on 10s, this means you're going to t 20s and 40s and 80s and 160s. And for some people, this is where we get, they run out of the potency of oxy and they go straight to heroin. Um, and that's a thing. Yes, you can absolutely crush Oxy. You can, you just dissolve the, you put it in your mouth for a second. It dissolves it enough to where you can rub the coloring off on your skin. There's definitely parties that I've been at where you see that people have bands of colors up and down their skin. And that usually that, that can be an indicator, um, that they've been on those pills and crushing it afterwards. It is difficult to crush while the coating is still on, but getting rid of the coating is not a challenge. Um, and so you can, you can kind of do that pretty easily. And yeah, you'll do anything. You'll do anything. And I can't blame them. When you look at the brain chemistry, I just can't blame them. Yeah. And I think, you know, we get that in a couple of examples in this episode. You know, we certainly see Dr. Phoenix at the end, but even through this episode, as he is maintaining the addiction levels of everyone in his town that he prescribed oxy to and there's that scene where he's going through all the pills where he is traveling yeah. around the country because he has a because he's a doctor he's able to get in to see other doctors and you know is able to get prescriptions filled for oxy he travels all over the south to collect enough pills to then distribute to his town. And, and the, the, the guy who's helping him um, do it said, like, you know, you, go, you, you do so much work to keep us from dope sick. Yeah. And I should say here, if you've heard of methadone, this is a good place to, enter, to introduce this conversation because the show has not yet. Methadone is a, um, so the way they describe it is that it's a non-addictive opioid. Um, which I know sounds really, really crazy to all of you right now, but it's a chemical, it's a fake out. It's a, it's a, it's a brain fake out. And so it behaves like an opioid to your brain to rewrite what's going on, but it does it in a way that it means entirely synthetically manufactured. It does it in a way that that can be a thing that weans you off. Mm. So methadone can be a thing. There's methadone clinics. A lot of insurance companies currently will not pay for rehab, but they'll pay for methadone clinics. Um, where if you are using it correctly, methadone can help you get clean from opioids in a very effective way. You can also take methadone and combine it with some other drugs and you get the high from opioids at the same time without the weaning off effect. So methadone can be a double-edged sword for some people. It's why it's not a panacea fi fix. And methadone's been around forever. It's been around for since the 70s, I think. So yeah. it can prevent dope sick. It's one of the reasons that you know you don't need to cold turkey. Methadone is the thing that can prevent dope sick as you're getting sober. You're still going to be fecking miserable from everything I've ever heard, but it'll prevent the worst, the worst effects of dope sickness. Um, but if you don't use it properly, I'm using air quotes for our podcast people, it can also continue to support your addiction. Yeah. And I just, I just glanced at my notes and I'll have to correct myself. We had the, the flash of, of Phoenix traveling all over the South in the next episode. Um, so apologies for the pre-spoiler if you're watching our coverage in, in line with, with the shows. Um, but we, we do start to get this sense of what it, what it will look like. And in this episode specifically, I do know we get that through Beth's yeah, where, for sure. where we see her relationship with this guy who is the dealer, um, she works at a gas station now because she lost her job at, in the mine from the accident. And she, through her, we see all the lengths you will go to to get more pills. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where she even is coerced into a sexual act from a doctor so that she can get more pills. 
Um, and this is, you know, what Kristen was talking about when she said, like, so many humans turn to sex work as a as an exchange, uh, as a way to pay for pills, as a way to get pills, all of these things. Um, so the abuse of humans who become addicted to this, like, knows no depths. So let's now scream about the letter, shall we? Let's scream about those five lines. This is one of those topics where Aaron and I could probably spend the next seven years screaming about it, and we will. But in this podcast, I want to briefly explain scientific, the word scientific study to our listeners and viewers who have not encountered it before. Here's what you need to know. There is no way on God's green earth or any of the planets that Thor owns that a five line letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine is a study. No, no way close. He even no. says that. Dr. Jix says that. He goes, it was a supposition. It was yeah. an idea. It was something I thought was interesting. Yeah. It was like based, and he says it based off of a con- confined hospital setting, a small group of patients with a very controlled environment. Which then means that you cannot extrapolate that idea no. into much bigger, uncontrolled settings. In order for it to be a study, it has to be replicable. And it has to be... There are so many parameters to a study. We don't even do hard science where people's lives are at stake. And the amount of hoops we have to jump through to call something a study is insane compared to a five-line letter. So I know we keep saying that... that Purdue is the evil person here. And I want to draw this line for you. Portnoy is part of that. But just a reminder, Portnoy is tangentially employed by Purdue to be running all of these pain things. Seminars. Seminars, associations. Portnoy is in bed with Purdue. So if you were concerned that we were asking you to spread your ire to anything beyond Purdue, we want to let you know that that Portnoy is part of the Purdue solar system. Um, And it's particularly insidious because evidently he was very helpful to Phoenix when Phoenix lost his wife in in, in Portnoy's writings about pain. Mm. Um, So it makes me want to throat uh, throat punch him. But it is unmitigatingly disgusting That this one, I cannot fathom why no one ever tested it. I can't, like, it went on for like 15 years. People just kept citing this thing and no one thought to look for it. Like, I mean, I'm lazy sometimes as an academic and I'll cite something that somebody (laughs) else cited because like, I don't want to go digging for it. But I'm fairly, I God, I hope, please, my mouth to all deities ears. If it was do, if it was something to do with addiction, I would double check the source. I would hope. Yeah, and I mean, this is the this is the problem we get into with um, the separation of the academy and academic methodologies and practices from the rest of society, where people mm. don't know that they should be asking questions. Um, and and we've built this uh, false sense of security. That if it's cited, oh, it's cited in an academic journal. Oh, it's, oh, it says national in the title of that organization. We, like, we, we give these people, we give them authority without questioning it, without critiquing it, without asking for receipts. I would hope we're much better at it now, especially since the term asking for receipts is, like, more colloquially accepted. But... Yeah, like, as a human, I was disgusted by what happened. As an academic, I was disgusted that w- there was no diligence done. Because None. because the statement was useful for pain specialists and then eventually Purdue Pharma. I mean, it's no coincidence that it showed, like, 1986 was when they started developing OxyContin in the first place at Purdue, and that's the first time it's cited in a pain magazine, and it's co-written by Portnoy. I mean, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to start connecting those strings on on a message board. Um, And isn't pain magazine partially underwritten by Purdue? Like, physically, like, I think they pay for it. It has to be one of those. It has to be one of those. And, like, that, that was the thing... That, that got me in that episode and when the episode where they were at the pain seminar as well. And they throw out all these, you know, names of organizations, the American Pain Association, 
the Association for Pain Specialists of America. Like, you know, we can all invent names like this. And, and as a society, we implicitly trust things that, that call themselves associations or organizations or all this without asking questions. And that's again, when I just looked at Dr. Kristen was like, everything's a lie. Everything's a lie. Um, and that nobody, nobody double checked. No, no person thought, wait a second, less than 1% addicted to a class two narcotic. That, that sounds can- silly. That can't be right. Where's the evidence for this? What did that study look like? How many participants were there? What was the scope? What were the controls? Um, and yeah, I, I can't I can't think of a different word besides disgusting, but it literally made me like physically ill. Yeah, it's In abhorrent that... behavior. I'm thinking, what other words can we throw out here? It's <laughs> abhorrent behavior. It's malfeasance. Oh yeah. Oh it's oh it's criminal malpractice. It's criminal it's... malpractice. It's academic malpractice for sure. Anyone who cited that damn thing in a journal needs to print yeah. a retraction if that was part of your hypothesis because it's not it's, a proven study. It's unethical. Oh yeah. I mean it's just all the things. I should say too, the thing that really that particularly gets my chaps my ass, as <laughs> as they would say about this, um, <laughs> is that pain was maligned. Yeah. So much so that nobody was asking questions. And by the time, which I'm sure somebody at Purdue knew. And so by the time they were ready to do this thing, it became this deluge of information that they controlled. So like the rest of the medical community wasn't talking about pain. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they did it, they orchestrated it to where it seemed so incredible, so fast, so good that nobody thought to question it. Slower stuff. I mean, my God, look at all the questioning we're having over MNRA vaccines that have been in development for decades. decades so yeah this was a marketing decision this yeah. was the re they just flooded the market with information and every single piece of information they published said that this thing was great so again purdue as an organization are evil assholes and um i await the day that that family is bankrupt no am i am i upset to say that on youtube i am not i am not upset to say that on youtube because i do look forward to that day yeah, and I think it's a combination of that, um, of the, the the criminal misuse of that study, um, study, I'm not even calling it, letter, um, the criminal misuse of that tidbit of information. Of that post-it um, note. <laughs> I have post-it like, notes with honestly, more it's sentences a tweet. on it. Like, it's um, a, tu- like, yeah. I have written Tumblr yeah. posts longer than that letter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's... Um, so I think it's the combination of that becoming then the like foundation for their sales pitch, right? Yep. Cause we learned that in earlier episodes that like, that was what they hammered home to the sales force was yep. less than 1%, less than 1%, less than 1%. So you take that and then you take this bull shit PSA video oh. that they in- sent out to 15,000 doctors knowing that they intentionally told the participants not to mention Oxy by name. Uh, So, like, that, those two things combined to me is, like, don't try to, don't, don't try to, like, both and Purdue Pharma with me. Don't try Mm -hmm. to other side Purdue Pharma with me. They did those two things so that they could make money. Correct. And there was no, even in Richard Sackler's statement that we can cure the world of pain, there was two conversations. There was, there was a very clear decision he made when he heard about breakthrough pain, Mm -hmm. which was proof that he was not curing the world of pain with this drug. And he created breakthrough pain so that he could make money. So if at the beginning you want to make the argument with me that his, his motives were pure or cool, the minute breakthrough pain came out of his mouth, that's it. He made his decision. And we can, we have in the past talked about, you know, trying to find some understanding for why he made those decisions, trying to find some, some things like that. But really the only motivating factor that I've ever seen, not just from this show, but from the books I've read and the articles I've read is that they are petrified of not having money. Yeah. Like they are petrified of not having money and there is no other motivating factor. If somebody from the Sackler family would love to correct me, 
I would love to stand corrected, but the only evidence we have seen is an absolutely toxic love of money. Yeah, and I mean, they, they created Breakthrough Pain. They invented Breakthrough Pain. Um, they funded all of the organizations that made pain the fifth vital sign. And then in this episode, they found a doctor, like, oh, that persnickety addiction um, was starting to make the news. And, and it was, people were talking about how people were becoming addicted to Oxycontin. And they were like, oh, well, we can't have that because if they're addicted to it and it's known to people, then they won't bomb the drugs. So then they find this dentist quack who says that people who are in pain, their pain is undermanaged. They're not addicted. They need more oxy. So you can miss me like the broadside of a bus with any argument that they were doing it for anything else than profit. Be interesting to see as we go into episodes five, six, seven, and eight, which none of us, neither one of us, as you, we talk to you guys, have watched. Some of it is that I need to be either in Dr. Aaron's physical presence or in a very specific mind space to be able to watch these episodes. So um, we will, I'll be interested to see what cracks out um, from obviously also the book is older than the show, OBS. So I'm hoping there's some uh, further information than the book gave us as we sit here at the uh, almost halfway point of this incredible work of art. Mm. Um, but I think that's where I'm comfortable closing pseudo addiction discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, please, uh, for, pals, as you watch this, as you listen to this, if you have responses or anything else, we didn't say this last time, but I want to reiterate again for episodes one and two. If you or someone you love has been affected or is being affected by this uh, lie, this this uh, untruth industrial complex that Purdue has us all living in, and you would like a place to tell your story, please know that we're listening. And we would love to provide you with that processing. Our DMs are open, as are our emails, and we would love to be able to speak with you as we can. In the meantime, please comment below if you've watched this on YouTube. We love knowing where you've watched it from. If you're engaging with it, um, give us a like, give us a subscribe. We will talk about every single episode. Don't worry. If you're on the podcast app of your choice, follow us so that we can make sure that not only you get this content, but everybody the algorithms recommend us to <laughs> get this content based on your likes. Thank you so much for your support. It really does mean the world. Uh, take care, everybody, and we will see you next for episode five, if not before then.